Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. My name is Alex Waltz. I'm a senior planner here at RTA. Um, just to note, this meeting is being recorded, and we are going to wait maybe just another minute or so to let a couple more people trickle in before we get started. All right, it seems like we've reached critical mass to some degree. We're, I'm gonna start with introductions anyway, so uh, let's get started right now. Um, hi everybody, my name is Alex Waltz. I'm a senior planner here at RTA in the local planning group. Uh, welcome to our this webinar for today, Transit and Industrial Corridors, focusing on community experience, accessibility, and freight interactions. Just a brief introduction about the Transportation Tuesday series. It's a four-part series this year. Um, in which we're bringing together RTA staff and regional and national leaders to discuss trends in transportation planning as they relate to RTA's implementation of our new regional strategic plan called Transit is the Answer. Today, uh, we're going to explore how freight and transit interact with each other and how um, residents and communities are impacted by industrial corridors and how the transit experience is impacted by them. Um, as you may have read in kind of the blurb about this session, transit and freight movement are two pretty quintessential aspects of Chicago's legacy, its present and also its future. Uh, but industrial corridors are not necessarily equitably distributed across neighborhoods. And this webinar will explore the interactions between freight vehicles and transit from both an infrastructure and community impact perspective. And we're Pleased to be joined by guest speakers representing municipal governments, transit agencies, and community-based organizations. Um, so without further ado, thanks for being here, and let's get started. We'll start just by, um, I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves, um, and I'm just looking on my list here, starting with David Tomzik from PACE. Hi, uh, welcome. I'm Dave Tomzik, uh, PACE Planning Program Manager, or saying strategic planning for the agency. Next, uh, Jeffrey Schreiber. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Schreiber. I uh, oversee uh, planning uh, here at the uh, City of Chicago's Department of Transportation. Uh, and that includes our interactions on uh, freight planning. Next is Jose. Uh, hey everybody, thanks for being here today. I'm Jose Acosta. I am a senior transportation policy analyst at the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. Uh, and I lead all of our transportation policy work, mostly related to freight, um, but uh, also every other things related to public transit. I'm also one of the co-chairs of the Transportation Equity Network. Thank you. Thanks. And last but certainly not least, Catherine. Hi, y'all. My name is Catherine Nickley. I'm a transportation planner at Sam Schwartz Consulting. Uh, most of my work is actually in pedestrian and bicycle safety, uh, and a big part of that is how it relates to getting to transit. Uh, and part of my work is also on the Vision Zero team at CDOT. Thanks all for coming. Great. Thanks, everybody. 
So to begin, just to kind of preface this session today, um, departing a little bit from the previous ones, we're gonna be mostly focused on just a roundtable discussion um, about a variety of different topics that kind of fall under this umbrella. Um, so we have a series of questions that we'd like to ask the panelists um, and get their input on. They're loosely grouped by theme. Um, and if there are questions that kind of come to mind as we're discussing, please feel free um, and you're invited to post those in the chat. Um, we're going to reserve roughly about 15 minutes or so at the end for a question and answer session. Um, but if you know you ask a question and it kind of ties into what we're talking about at the moment, um, I'll raise that with the panelists at that time. So yeah, please put your questions into the chat. Uh, my colleague, Natalie, will be helping me um, sift through those and ask questions at the end. Um, so let's get started just with some very kind of general questions to begin. Um, what are some of the important or impactful issues that you want people to know about transit service and the rider experience in industrial corridors? I guess I can uh, kick us off. Um, I've been thinking about this question a lot recently. Um, for me, uh, thinking about the pedestrian point of view, it's thinking about how you are accessing uh, transit along industrial corridors. And that looks like how are you getting to the transit stop, but also getting from your transit stop. Thanks. And and I think with this, this might tee up to Jose, um, thinking about the um, impacts of industrial corridors, so noise pollution, environmental pollution. Um, Jose, I know you do a lot of work on this, so I might pass it to you. Uh, thanks, Catherine. Yeah, no, and, uh, I mean, I think the, the biggest issue for, uh, for both pedestrians, um, cyclists, anybody who's using transit in the industrial corridors is the issue of truck traffic um, and what that means for safety. Uh, for air pollution, of course, what you're exposed to just when you're trying trying to get to to a bus stop um, or or a CTA stop on the southwest side and the southeast side, um, other parts of the south and west side is where we have the largest industrial corridors in the city. Um, so you're talking about some that are over a thousand acres in, in industrial area, um, and many of these areas are are limited in in terms of uh, um, quality access for. For, for uh, pedestrians and riders. So what I mean is that some of these areas, the the, the uh, sidewalks are either non-existent or crumbling. Um, so even just to get to an industrial area, or I'm sorry, into a, a CTA stop um, is, is also difficult for, for folks. And uh, so some of the issues of, in the suburban side are not only the issues of trying to get to and from the bus stop to the, the, the facilities and locations in terms of sidewalks, we've talked about that, but also the throughput of the, the, the route of the passengers, those the vehicle passing through that industrial area that it can travel efficiently through and not get delayed for those passengers traveling beyond say that corridor. But it's also the land use of how, how developments are sited, how uh, the employee entrance is located, that it's an efficient way to get to and from that vehicle and uh, incorporated in with land use and zoning and planning. I, would, I can also just add um, that uh, I think kind of uh, there's two aspects. One uh, is that the the streets that the, the buses uh, primarily use um, are are the same as the streets that that trucks use, so that that you know underscores and kind of intensifies, particularly the concerns that Catherine and Jose brought up. Um, that there's this this interaction is sort of a, a necessity. So it, uh, um, well, it raises the question: how well, how do we <laughs> how do we manage that interaction in a way that that's safe and comfortable for everybody that's using it. And then I would say that another, maybe another thing to think about as we continue our discussion are these sort of differences between the way that the uh, older industrial areas of, of the city and of the region are configured versus the way they're configured in um, newer areas or even just newer developments, say out you know, in the city relative to the suburbs or just newer versus older developments in the city. And maybe there's some parallels between the way that the industrial uses are, are laid out or spread out um, in the newer developments um, that are kind of akin to just the way that 
more car centric developments are are uh, are spread out kind of all over the, the region and which makes it harder harder to walk to. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, I think what you touched on kind of leads into our second question, um, which some of you alluded to tangentially. What do you think are some of the root causes of some of the issues you've experienced or have been working with um, and are trying to navigate? Um, I can. I, I, mean, I think just to build off of what what Jeffrey's saying, I, um, you know, I think because some of these areas, particularly in the south and west sides, are are much older industrial areas. Um, you know, some of these they, they, they've been here for you know more than 150 years, even. Um, right, you're talking about very old infrastructure, right? So I mean, it's very established infrastructure. Um, so because of where the intermodal rail yards are located, where the rail lines are located, um, where the highways are located. Right, the you know these areas have have been transformed post the industrialization period to become primarily primarily used for for the movement of goods. Um, so you've had this high concentration of of trucking facilities of you know transportation distribution logistics facilities in these areas, um, and and that's made, that's caused a, a you know over congestion of of uh, an oversaturation of 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 uh, not only the the facilities themselves but of the truck traffic. Um, so. That's part of the issue. When you look at, like, like Jeffrey said, some of the areas on the north side of it that have been redeveloped recently. You think about the North Branch area, some of the other industrial areas, or or the area uh, in you know the West Loop. Um, these uh, and like West near West Side, um, these areas have, have been transformed to be more diverse in in the economic activity that's there. So they they still attract some truck traffic, uh, but nowhere near the the uh, to the scale that we're seeing on the south and south and, uh, and south. And west side so um the root cause is really just the historical land use patterns in these areas and the fact that um you know our political and economic leaders have supported the the growth of tdl as a response to the loss of of massive employment during deindustrialization uh and because and 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 you know the fact that they're using infrastructure as justification for for why these facilities are being concentrated there in the first place And Jose, TD, TDL is it, um, like trucking, distribution, and logistics. Okay. Yes. Yes. Transportation, distribution, and logistics. So to build on that, um, uh, you know, there's just trends too have also been going in a direction of uh, larger, longer, and and heavier trucks. Um, and this has been, you know, for many generations, it's just things just keep seem to getting bigger and bigger and bigger, um, you know, that which creates efficiencies on the parts of the companies that are providing the trucking services, but then has negative externalities then that are felt by anyone else using the roads. So, so there's kind of that, that trend that's happening. There's also, again, to touch upon a, a comment that Jose made, the, a lot of the old rail yards in, in the city um, that, you know, had started out 100 plus years ago as just general classification yards when the freight rail system tended to be more self-contained is like when goods started and ended their journeys on a train have now kind of transformed into intermodal yards. Uh, where where it's moving moving containers, um, but we're getting some feedback here. Uh, we're moving uh, containers around, and then the containers may travel on a steamship overseas, and then get loaded to a train, and then come to Chicago and get loaded onto a truck, or or and reverse. So when when we're moving these you know large containers around, then you know you know it's the impacts. Come not only on the on the railroad, but also on the on the roads and on the on the truck side of things too. So just the there's a lot of trade-offs involved. Um, you know, on the on the one hand, these systems are very efficient, but on the other hand, they have they have impacts and, and externalities that 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 we grapple with. And and it takes the sort of a lag between the extra grappling with the externalities and the uh, efficiencies that are that are seen Im immediately. And a lot of times it comes down to planning and design of, of the facilities. Um, when you look at uh, freight and, and warehousing, uh, the issue is they're, they're focused on uh, bringing the trucks in, bringing the freight in, and pedestrian and infrastructure and transit sometimes are not always included, That that uh, you know, including sidewalks, for example, within an industrial park. 
Um, so that's important to, to develop as from the beginning. And especially in the suburban areas where you have some either new development or redevelopment, um, you can make recommendations and PACE has a transit support of guidelines that we encourage um, developers and municipalities to follow to prepare the area to support transit. So it's the smaller things that really start, yeah, starting from the beginning in a lot of these areas as to how you prepare and plan for transit to be accommodated. Thanks everyone. And I think that leads into kind of our next question. We've talked a little bit about some of these. Um, what are some of the primary issues that transit riders face when traversing corridors that have lots of truck traffic? I know Catherine brought up um, noise and um, vehicle pollution. Are there any others that you would add to that list um, for some of the issues that trend that specifically affect transit riders? Well, for, for pedestrians, our transit riders are pedestrians, and whether it's trying to cross the street and uh, larger, as Jeff mentioned, the trucks have become larger. You know, the you know forty five foot trucks need a larger turning radius, a bigger turning radius. That's more space for that pedestrian that has to get across that that street. So there's um, there's those issues. There's there's the issues of when you're on along a street and the sidewalk may be very close that you're having these trucks pass you. Um, so it's it's put put yourself in the perspective of the passenger and the, that environment. And then you add the noise, the pollution, and um, the congestion as to how, how you have access throughout that corridor. Yeah, when someone on, on foot, which is all everybody who's heading to and from a bus or a train, is trying to share their you know the street environment with heavy vehicles. It's a it's a it's a high stress environment. Even when it works, you know, well when it's safe, at least you know in theory, it's still a high higher stress environment when when you're when you're near nearby to these these very large uh, vehicles. So that you know that that even in the best case, it, it diminishes the uh, the attractiveness of 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 walking. Yeah, and to echo Dave and, and Jeff. The way I look at it is kind of bucket it into between like safety concerns, there's comfort concerns and the health concerns. So we've talked about health of the negative externalities that come with it, the safety concerns of crossing the street and accessing the transit stop, and then also comfort. Uh, you know, if you're waiting on at a bus stop, that's just a signpost and it's a narrow sidewalk with no buffer between the road, it's not comfortable to wait there, especially when there's large freight that is going uh, at a fast speed right along the sidewalk. And just to add real quick to, um, you know, because there's been a lot of efforts and we're, we're a, a big part of the efforts that are happening uh, both locally at the state level and at the federal level to electrify heavy duty trucks, medium and heavy duty trucks. Um, so I just want to add in, right, that, um, you know, electrification also, although it does deal with the, the air pollution issue, and that is probably the most significant issue, just given the impacts that it has to, to public health, um, is that the fact that there's been, you know, um, there's been now some studies looking at uh, actually these trucks are weighing heavier, are a little bit heavier than a diesel truck. Um, so that's one concern in terms of thinking about the damage to infrastructure, what it means for for roads, for uh, for folks who are not as able to be able to cross roads that are that are being destroyed by by trucks, um, but also the acceleration issue, right? And, and we know we know that diesel trucks are very loud. Anybody who's passed by a truck knows that. Um, but these electric trucks are going to be quieter, and they're also going to accelerate faster. Um, so that that also brings a set of challenges for 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 pedestrians who are you know crossing roads and and might not hear the truck coming, or or a semi truck is is you know taking off from a light, and and then you know their visibility is limited on. They can't see a pedestrian uh, or somebody passing by in a uh, on a bicycle or on a in a wheelchair, for example. So, uh, so I think the electrification is something that uh, we still need to be. It's, it's something we should be advocating for. But I think to to the point earlier that was made by I think by David about how we're planning for pedestrians in these industrial areas or next to freight facilities is really crucial when we're thinking about these long term transitions away from from diesel. Thanks, everyone. And yeah, um, to clarify. For the purposes of this conversation, we're mostly going to be focusing on 
freight uh, in the form of trucks um, and vehicles, not necessarily rail, uh, but that is a, you know, a component um, in the region as well. So moving on, um, we talked a little bit about this. Um, I'm curious to get into yeah, issues related to routing uh, transit vehicles, specifically serving industrial land uses, because of course they are also you know, job centers, um, but how do people access those? Are they getting there on transit? That's also an issue. And then also um, kind of related to what Jose just said, maintenance of um, infrastructure, be it pedestrian or the roadway itself. Um, so I'm curious, what are some difficulties that you've noticed related to providing transit service to truck focused or industrial land uses? And I think Jeffrey alluded to this a little bit earlier, does this change depending on the setting or the type of the land use thinking about, you know, is, are these issues the same in a suburban industrial park versus a single individual uh, industrial parcel in the city? Yeah, I think like I yeah, kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, I was getting ahead of myself, sorry. <laughs> you know, the, uh, um, I think there's there's it's somewhat analogous to the you know the issues that that we you know deal with with as planners a lot when things are more spread out um you know there just makes it that much more difficult for people to to walk there and if it's hard to walk it's also hard to take transit so the the concentrated activity in the in the uh, older urban areas um then it brings things closer together which in that in that sense makes it easier to walk um but having these concentrated activities can also, like again, increase the the stress of what's happening when there's large vehicles in, involved because you don't have very much space between yourself as a pedestrian and and the large vehicle. Um, so they're kind of they're at, at odds to one another. Whereas in the suburban environment, maybe you have more space. So at least in theory, there might be a way to design this a road in a more comfortable manner, provide a parkway, or provide some kind of landscaping that might separate the the pedestrian from. The large vehicles, but then if things are more spread out, well, okay, you just have that much further to walk, <laughs> so that that runs against you know the the uh, the, the desire to to walk. So it's yeah, there's there's opposing trade offs. Yeah, for example, in some of our suburban areas, um, especially in some larger distribution. Um, uh, enclosures uh, such as Joliet area where you have uh, these, you know, they're size of football fields, some of these uh, warehousing areas and, and you have certain delivery times with trucks and you have a, you know, 10 trucks stacked up outside on the street. I mean, like Jeff said, you have the, the, the width, the, but you have this barrier now of, of to how you, the bus has, or vehicle has to maneuver around those trucks and then how the passenger now there's a barrier for that passenger to get around if there's, you know, 10 trucks that are waiting their their time to get into the, the loading docks. So there's there's also, you know, that's that also is a negative too sometimes as to um, how they miss stack up the trucks and versus say on a smaller corner where you might have a truck trying to back into a loading dock that blocks the street. Yeah, I think um, I think you know. So thinking about in Little Village, right? We you know we we recently went through or a few years ago went through um, a modernization process with the Department of Planning, um, and during that you know during that uh, the data analysis and 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 um, collection that that DPD you know made during that they they came up they came by their own by their own uh, statistics and analysis said that less than 5% of little village residents actually work in our industrial corridor, right? So the fact that very few people from the neighborhood are even working in the local industrial area means that, you know, virtually virtually nobody is, is walking to work um, and even fewer people I'm sure are taking transit to work. Um, so, you know, I think part of the part of the issue and I, th I think going back to, to, you know, what people have said about how we're developing this land, right? These, these you know, you, you, you think about the old factories and just how different they were versus you know these these large warehouses and distribution centers with these large parking lots um right it, it was very different very very different land use 
types. And, you know, my, my grandpa was a factory worker at, at Brock's Candy Factory on the west side. People are familiar with that. Um, and he used to take the train every day to work, right? The, he would take the green line um, and, and he was literally a block away from work and able to, to get there, uh, you know, virtually with, without any issues. Um, but that's just not an option for, for a lot of folks in today's, in today's age and, and, and how we're doing these developments. Um, and the other thing too, is that I forgot to mention that uh, as part of that little village uh, industrial corridor plan, uh, we, they, the city acknowledged that uh, at least half of the people who are working our, in, their, in our industrial corridor are coming in from the suburbs. Um, so of course, you know, they're not taking transit in to get to the industrial area. Um, so I think the, the big, the, a big issue is how we're developing this land with these large parking lots. Uh, and the fact that for most people taking transit, not only is it not a, a, a viable option, but it just doesn't make any sense for them time-wise. I think the large parking lots is definitely something I want to echo that. And uh, the work that we've done in some suburbs, um, you see these the industrial parks and there'll be, you know, transit on a major arterial that's nearby. Um, but then the route from the transit stop to the place of employment, there's, um, you know, no sidewalks. Uh, and then you have to cross a large, um, empty, often um, parking lot. And it's not very comfortable or uh, efficient for the person who's taking um, transit. So a lot of people choose to drive um, or carpool. I think I'm interested by some of these other questions, but I do want to keep moving so we can um, talk about some of the other topics and leave some time for Q&A. Um, so we'll move on to the next topic related more so to um, kind of the roadway itself. So we've talked a little bit about this, but just to drill down, does, in your opinion, do you think roadway design contributes to these issues? And if so, what are some of the consequences? And do you think that roadway design on its own is an appropriate solution to these issues? And maybe what would you kind of package with that to deliver kind of a more holistic um, menu of, of different opportunities for improvement? Well, it's, yeah, I mean, the roadway design is, you know, go back to any, you know, whether it's industrial corridor or residential corridor, it encourages what the roadway interaction is. Um, if you have a wide roadway, it will encourage speed, it will encourage, um, you know, the, the driver behavior, um, building all the roads to accommodate um, larger trucks, which may not always be appropriate. I know, Audrey, you, you put in there in the chat about the legislation that, that's that been passed about uh, uh, designing appropriate intersections of trying to um, make make that more appropriate. But yeah, I mean, there's there you know just the whole complete streets concept is is how do we implement that? And, and just adding more roadways and making them wider may not be the best solutions. I mean, what is the context solution for that environment? Just to jump in quickly, um, for people who don't know, Complete Streets um, is both kind of like a concept and a policy uh, that in most cases requires governments to provide accommodation for pedestrians and bicyclists when a new roadway is built or when um, a roadway is undergoing major rehabilitation. So that might not always apply to resurfacing, uh, but certainly if they're redoing the subgrade of the road um, or building a brand new roadway, um, many governments are, usually it's they have signed a, a, a policy, so subjecting themselves to that requirement, but some state governments like Massachusetts um, have state level requirements for complete streets policies. Many of the issues surrounding freight and the nature of our economy are uh, are very kind of macro scale issues. It's what's happening in the in the global economy and the national economy, and um, and they're they're unfortunately at a local level we kind of have to 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 deal with uh, um, treat treating the the symptoms <laughs> more than than we have leverage so to 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 treat the uh, the root causes of some of these problems um and so in that in that sense the the 
the roads, the street configuration is something that that largely is handled at a local level. I mean, it's the local governments, along with the this you know the state, their you know regulations at a state level, too. And that with that uh, the 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 policy that we're just talking about was a state level policy that that hopefully you now with these changes we'll see some positive impacts on street design. But this is very tangible and at a local level. But when we talk about the nature of trucks, the size of trucks, the volume of freight and where it's coming from and where it's going to, that's that's much, much more difficult to like have a have an impact on at a at a local level that tends to be more of a, a, a national and a and a global issue. So kind of the the leverage, the lever points are in are in different places. I think we we briefly mentioned this as well. Um, but I wanted to ask again, what are some of the trade-offs kind of inherent in designing roadways for a variety of different users of different, you know, typical size? Um, and how do some of those design decisions impact pedestrians or transit riders or operators? Well, I think I think one of the things that, that also makes it tough is that um regardless of how a road is designed or how it's designated that a lot of these these truck drivers because of how you know the industry is set up right where many of them are independent contractors many of them you know they make their money only if they deliver their their load by a certain time frame um they're encouraged to to you know to to not abide by the rules in terms of where they're actually allowed to be right so we see this happening all the time in the city where you know they're they're taking residential streets where again they're not allowed to be but so regard so sometimes regardless of how a road is designed right and going back to to Jeffrey's point right some of these issues are larger national issues that we're not going to deal with at a local level because that's an in, in, in you know industry um you know issue right and how it's been deregulated since the, the 1980s but um but I think just in general you know I think there are solutions to you know to like some of the stuff with with complete streets or you know some of the some of the different um you know barriers that you can create to make it safer for pedestrians and cyclists and other drivers that at least will make it somewhat safer uh, but again because that's a larger issue you know how a road is designed unfortunately won't make a difference sometimes because the truck drivers are still gonna they're still gonna travel down in re residential streets um and then of course that has a, a number of other negative impacts on on local communities And I think this comes down to what the roadway design, uh, who it's prioritizing. So thinking about I'm looking in the comments and I feel like everyone knows uh, a roadway near them um, that has a lot of freight on it. Um, and yeah, just thinking about who that street is designed for. So if we think about a street that has several very wide lanes um, dedicated for uh, freight um, and vehicle use. Uh, there's trade-offs for it's not as comfortable for pedestrians and transit riders and cyclists. Um, going back to that sense of complete streets. Um, and I guess tacking off, Jose, what you said about how uh, a lot of truck drivers will go into, I guess, uh, residential areas, I think roadway design um, can also feed into this. So thinking about, I guess, planners will have to think about how can we discourage drivers from wanting to go on those residential streets, um, designing it so it's uncomfortable for a truck to go on it, but it's comfortable for a pedestrian. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree. And just to underscore that, I, I think there are a lot of design treatments that can be done to, to make roads feel uncomfortable for a trucker or to, to be like a not an attractive route. It's true that I mean, if if somebody wants to go somewhere, they'll probably just do it, and then there's an enforcement issue. But mm -hmm. to the extent that 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 we can design, you know, try to come up with physical design solutions to discourage the types of activities or uses of streets that we don't want, um, you know, that that is another tool that we have, um, and especially at a local level, you know, we don't have lots of tools, but that is a tool, and, and we try to do it. Of course, there's you know, thousands and thousands of miles of streets in the city. And so, uh, you know, there's also the ever present resource issue of where do we apply these these tools to and in what priority and what order. 
Um, so that's something obviously that CDOT has to grapple with every every day. But but we do try to use design as a as a tool where we can. Are there any particular sites that you can think of that are kind of good examples of how um, maybe truck heavy land uses can integrate well with the neighborhood or make it more of a pedestrian friendly environment? Do any come to mind? And it's okay if not. I've been trying to think about this question, Alex, uh, the last few days of any good examples. And I personally am coming up short. Um, and curious if anyone else on the call has an idea of a good example. I'd love to, to hear it. Yeah, it's more examples of trying to mitigate, but yeah. <laughs> to very de various degrees of, it, of, of uh, effectiveness. Um, I think like this this photo that we're looking at on the screen right now it brought up one another another a tool and they're not all the tools aren't just curb bump outs and other you know physical road geometry things another tool in the toolbox is uh, vegetation um, and that having um, mature and larger vegetation um, actually uh, a lot of the 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 air pollution problems with trucks is um, not only exhaust, but also the, the dust and the particulate metal that's kicked up by having all of those tires and rubbing against all those surfaces. And uh, trees are remarkably effective at, uh, um, or leaves, <laughs> are remarkably effective at, uh, you know, at, at trapping a lot of that particulate matter. Um, and then when it rains, it, you know, it flows off and gets washed out that way. Um, so again, not, no, no, no. One of these tools is a silver bullet. That, but, but, uh, you know, but the, to the extent that we can try to use as many tools as we can, given the context that we're in, I just wanted to kind of bring that up as yet another tool. Yeah, thanks for that, and I think that kind of leads into um, part of the next discussion is, yeah, in addition to street trees, what other streetscape elements are maybe compatible with truck traffic and provide kind of positive benefits to pedestrians and what maybe elements are incompatible? What would you, what do you think um, freight operators would, um, I guess, react negatively to if that was included in a new street design? Well, I think some of it just comes down to, on principle, like where, where, where should the trucks be permitted, and where do we want them to be discouraged? Um, so, um, if you put a a a type of treatment in a in a place in, that is intended to discourage trucks, in a place where actually trucks need to be permitted, it's an, you know if, if it's a place they need to go, well then there, there's going to be an, an incompatibility there, and and. Uh, um, that that won't work, but there's again trade-offs because uh, on anybody's given street, there you know everybody would <laughs> no, nobody wants to live on a street that has lots of truck traffic on it, and uh, but yet there are there are a lot of trucks and and uh, yeah. so how, how where where do we strike the how do we strike the right balance ongoing issue? Yeah, I mean you need the trucks to. Where, you know, to serve those industries without without the trucks bringing the, the goods in and out you don't have that industry which means if you don't have the industry how do you get the workers there that you don't need the transit so it, you, it has a balance and and like Jeff said it's the appropriateness of of the area and how to how to frame the trucks routes where they need to be and how the ones where you do have to work with transit you have to accommodate them i mean just like with bikes with pedestrians it's there's only so much width in the right of way but how can you make that better how do you how how can you serve those needs how do you serve those multimodal needs in that corridor and and in that in that corridor using the constraints of the width of the corridor and and there's only so much room that everybody could take up. I mean, yeah, I think um, 
I mean, I, I, I agree where the, 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 that, you know, we've created an economic system where these, these trucks are needed. We're, we're dependent on them bringing in those goods, not only for, for the industries themselves, but also the retailers, right? Us as consumers are dependent on, on getting access to a lot of these things. Um, so it's tough because it's really, you know, as it is right now, there is no compatibility, right? I mean, there's, with the way we have, the way we have at least set up is, you know, we're so concentrated and, and, you know, so such an issue in certain areas and not as much of an issue in others, you know, it's really um, made it so that, you know, it, it's, 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 it's too much. Our communities are overwhelmed with truck traffic and with the pollution and the other issues that come with it, right? So, I mean, we see, you know, any, any map that you look at in the city of Chicago, whether it's around race and then all the different socioeconomic categories, including environmental issues, there's a correlation between all of them. It's where people of color live and where the issue is, is and where there's an issue, right? So in this case, there's been plenty of maps that have been made that show that the air pollution, the cumulative impacts of heavy industry are primarily impacting people of color and low income communities, right? So there's no there's no way around that, right? So I think the the issue still is is that these things are not spread out enough, right? There, there's you know there's been a justification for concentrating these facilities in area areas that were formerly industrial with with manufacturing and other factories, um, and where you had massive job losses, right? So it was you know the the idea of replacing them with with warehouses and distribution centers it seemed like a good idea at the time because you were bringing jobs back to a community that desperately needed it. Um, and that's that can't be debated either. But I think what can be debated uh, and what can be remedied is the issue of environmental racism and how that's ultimately at the core of why these facilities have been located and con concentrated the way that they have been, right? And, and the, the, the argument of, oh, this is where the, warehouse, where the highways are at or where the rail lines are at is really just an excuse. For, for doing that. So I think that's the larger issue is, is how do we remedy, you know, decades and decades of environmental racism? Um, and, and where do we find that balance? Because at, that, at the root cause of this issue is that, and we, and we have to acknowledge that if we're going to be able to, to deal with, to deal with the legacy of that pollution, um, and then to come up with the plan for how we make this better. Thanks, and yeah, I think that that connects to the first question on the screen. That we we know that pollution and noise impacts are not distributed equitably throughout the region, um, and at least in the Chicago area, frequently those negative impacts are concentrated on the south and west sides of the city. Um, and I'm curious, what other impacts to health um, are there from truck traffic that we haven't talked about yet? Yeah, and, and and also the you know it is an issue in the city, but there's also a correlation between where industrial areas are at in the suburbs and where people of color live as well, right? Particularly for the Latino Latinx population and, and warehousing. There's been all along the I-55 corridor, all along the I-294 corridor. There's there's a ton of warehouses, and and a lot of the communities have have you know, went from being majority white to majority people of color. So there is that correlation also in the suburbs. Um, but we, when you think about the air pollution impacts, right, there's, there's respiratory issues that come with it and cardiovascular issues that come with it, right, asthma, um, uh, COPD, heart disease, uh, even there, there's um, diabetes and obesity are, are related, are, are correlated with, with uh, toxic air quality, uh, and then premature death, right, there, there was actually a report that the Respiratory Health Association uh, did last year, uh, or earlier this year, last year, um, not earlier this year, my apologies. Um, that that talked about like they called the dirty dozen report right and then we have the the 12 of the dirtiest counties in the country and cook county uh dupage county and will county i believe are, are all in the top one percent uh, or maybe it was just dupage and cook but are in the top one percent of the of the worst you know um the worst air quality in the country so we're talking about some of the worst air quality that anybody's breathing in this country and and that has some severe negative impacts on local communities and using clean air task force data they they estimated um that there would be 416 premature deaths in the state of illinois related to to diesel pollution um so this is literally something that's killing people every day um and and i think that's the larger issue we're not talking enough about this as a as a public health crisis the way that it needs to be And we're just about at 1245 right now. Um, 
So I think we'll open it up for questions um, from the audience and we can come back to some of these other questions uh, later on if need be. Um, so yeah, I'm curious, uh, Natalie, are there any questions that were submitted in the chat that you'd like to highlight and pose to the panelists? Yeah, so um, here's one. Is there anything that can be done from an advocacy perspective to make trucks smaller and safer for people outside of them? And if so, what would that look like? Yeah, that gets in. I think there was some some chat. I, I noticed that other people had brought up some uh, thoughts on this. And it does, like, tr trucks are, are regulated at various different levels, but primarily higher up on, on the food chain, the more they, there's national standards for truck design and for truck safety and for, you know, these features, which, you know, makes sense. And as much as like interstate commerce is something that happens at a national level. Um, so I think the, the advocacy effort, um, for better or worse, to, to make trucks safer, um, smaller helps make them safer, but even larger trucks can be made, arguably made safer than they are now with different design features and, uh, you know, techniques to to make pedestrians and other road users, more vulnerable road users, more visible and more apparent to truck drivers. Um, but that really needs to, those sort of regulations really need to take place at a national level, um, just because that's the, that's the nature of how, you know, trucking is regulated. Any other questions? Thanks, thanks, Jeff. Any other questions, Natalie? That came from um, the chat. Yeah. Um, what can our transit agencies do to encourage more local manufacturing to counter the dominance of large yards and warehouses built um, to handle shipping goods? I think that's a I personally think that's a great question. Um I think that's I think that's a, a major solution for a lot of it, a lot of things, not just not just the thing we're dealing with, but I think, you know, um just a larger globalization issue, right? Is the more localized production of, of goods and food and things like that, I think it could only be a positive thing. Um and I and I think it which kind of even answers the other question, right? Is if you have in if everything is coming in from local from local sources, then it makes it easier to have smaller trucks. Uh, because you know you have these these long haul transport trucks, you know, and the and the and the reason why they're doing why they have these such large trucks, like Jeffrey mentioned earlier, is because they it's more efficient for them, right? They can carry more goods in the in the larger container. Uh, but having you know more localized food production, for example, or localized manufacturing, um, you know, it, you know, you you could theoretically make an argument that um, that you can have smaller trucks because they you know they might be making more trips and and maybe that still adds more traffic to the road, but if they're electric and if they're uh, and if they're smaller, that at least you know eliminates some of those issues that we're talking about. Um, so I think no matter what, there's always going to be trade offs and and you know um, co compromises that we have to make within the system of moving goods. Um, but so 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 think about limiting the negative impacts as much as possible, whether it's air pollution or traffic safety or congestion. I think has to be at the root cause of our solutions, or at the root a root of our solutions. I mean, sorry. Yeah, I mean, this is a it's it's a regional issue, but it's also you know national and global issue. Is that you know we've become so dependent on shipping and the instantaneous. I, I want something before I even think of it. Amazon will deliver it, um, and it goes back to the whole design uh, where where communities where you could walk in a community, you can walk to the store, you can you can walk to the bakery. A lot of that is missing in 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 the, in our region is to the, the pedestrian environment of how you access goods and services. Um, and and also that ties into where the manufacturing is. Um, you know, there's been how many local shops that have been closed um, that have been replaced by big box or, or, or online type environments. So that also has an impact on how the shipping and distribution occurs. So, um, you know, again, it's a lot of it goes back to the land use and planning and and what type of environment we want for our region.
Um, I have another question from the chat. Yeah, um, so this one asks, has it been considered uh, by planners to dedicate specific routing for trucks or building things like pedestrian bridges? I think truck truck routing is or de or designating <laughs> truck routes is a very thorny issue. It kind of gets back to what I mentioned earlier in that um, everybody is all in favor of truck routes on somebody else's street. <laughs> no, nobody wants to say, yeah, bring the trucks to my street. I'll take them all. You know, so, but given that the trucks do need to go everywhere and, and generally speaking on commercial streets, there are, there are the locations of a lot of places where trucks need to get to, to, you know, to supply businesses, even if they're not heavy industries or you know trucking related industries they're kind of like the end destination of certain certain amount of truck traffic so um so it ends up being that uh it's more the the re, the re truck restrictions tend to be more on in the more obvious places of smaller residential streets streets that are you know that are more kind of obviously not appropriate for a truck but it's much harder to do a truck restriction on any kind of a, a through street or an arterial street um, where, but, the, but there are still impacts to the trucks on those streets even. So, so we need to find tools beyond sort of pro prohibitions or, or, or restrictions. Sometimes there are weight restrictions or there are clearance restrictions, but those are kind of as a result of kind of, um, legacy infrastructure, um, conditions. Although sometimes you find People don't want a, a, a vertical clearance or a height restriction to be improved, right? Because it, it ends up it ends up being a, a de facto a truck restriction. So those it create some interesting localized issues too. And yeah, they just, just to add to that, um, yeah, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, right? We we know we see the, literally on a daily basis where these trucks are traveling down residential blocks. Um, so the the somebody somebody brought up in the chat earlier about about uh, enforcement too, right? And and who who's 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 supposed to hold them accountable, and that also brings up a, a set of other challenges because many of these truck drivers are people of color, many of them are immigrants, many are women, right? So and they're already coming from over police communities. So you know the issue of of how do we enforce you know whether it's idling or whether it's you know trucks driving down roads that they're not allowed to be on. Right is, is how we enforce that it becomes that much more sensitive because we don't want to we don't want to make policing or or you know uh, enforcement uh, on on communities that have already been over police that more of an issue uh, and the, and the other thing too is because most of these drivers are independent contractors right the fact is that you're charging them for an issue that they didn't create right this is a larger national issue or, or uh, industrial issue with how they're how they're paid and how the the industry's been deregulated. Right. So, you know, it's one thing to, to you know, to uh, to tax an Amazon or a Target, you know, a couple hundred dollars. But to do that to an individual driver who's already, you know, making making a, a limited amount of funds every year, um, it, it's just, you know, it, it doesn't I don't think it sets a good precedent. So I think how we enforce things has to be much more. We have to be more creative in how we do that. It can't just be let's, you know, go and over police people who are already over police. And and getting to the topic of the pedestrian bridges, they the one thing is um, you know they would need to be accessible, so that determines either a ramp or an elevator. So you know just by that nature, um, I mean they they are used in 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 a lot of places, mostly with bike paths. You know you see a lot of them. Um, Las Vegas has tons of them on their street corners. They have the whole full intersection as, as street bridges, but they are very heavy intensive. And, uh, you know, how, how do you how do you fit that into a neighborhood, let's say, uh, providing make sure you have a ramp or an elevator and um, and then, you know, so, so it is something to, to consider, but it's also operations and expense and uh, the benefits of that, uh, but it is interesting and it has been used. It's just trying to find the appropriate areas of of how we deal with these. Yeah, I think with pedestrian bridges, yeah, if if it's um, appropriate, is making it uh, building it so people actually want and can use it. I've seen a good number of pedestrian bridges, especially out in the suburbs, 
where you'll still see people cross the street, even though there's a pedestrian bridge right there because they don't want to take the time to go around. So um, acknowledging uh, of those issues. And we see here in the picture that Alex is showing, um, this is 31st Street. And I think that a street like this, uh, it's more about pedestrian visibility and also speeds um, that uh, the traffic is taking. Um, so I think on these types of roads, a pedestrian bridge um, isn't appropriate, but it's more how can you make the person crossing the street or waiting for the bus visible um, and shortening their crossing distance. Catherine, do you think a raised crosswalk would be an appropriate, um, I guess, treatment for this? Or, yeah, what other, what other um, infrastructure improvements yeah. would you recommend to this intersection? So I guess it depends on who you are talking to. I'm sure the drivers of the bus, drivers of the trucks are not fans of the raised crosswalk and maybe a raised crosswalk might be more appropriate um, on the connecting street that would enter, let's say a residential area. Um, and I think here, um, you know, perhaps making you can there's other tools to make a crosswalk shorter while still acknowledging the uh, the bus that's on the street not not having to go about it. So, um, you know, having uh, curb extensions or a pedestrian refuge island that might um, that will make the pedestrian experience more comfortable while um, still making the the bus uh, experience comfortable. Thanks. We just have a couple minutes left, but I have one question in the chat that um, I think Jose briefly touched on, at least this topic. Um, I guess if, inviting you to look into the tea leaves, if you will, um, with potential future growth in electric vehicles and specific electric, specifically electric trucks, do you think that will have any bearing on roadway design in the future? I know for parking structures and parking garages, the increased weight of electric vehicles is a potential issue there. Are there any um, things you can see and yeah, the growth of electric vehicles? And I'm also curious from Jeffrey and Dave, have you learned anything from your respective agencies fleet electrification? Do you see any potential, yeah, what, what changes might kind of come out of that as it relates to um, trucking and electrification? Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm not f familiar with fleet electrification issues personally. Um, perhaps others are, but on the, uh, I think the points that Jose brought up earlier um, about the uh, electrified trucks, while having advantages on the on the emissions side, they they at least so far tend to be heavier, and then have faster acceleration, and that combination <laughs> introduces a whole new set of challenges. So I think. It, it's, yeah, unfortunately, these sort of things that may look like silver bullet solutions oftentimes come with other trade offs that we just aren't familiar with yet. And then, um, so we, yeah, just have to, the struggle continues. It's not always, it's not just the vehicle. I mean, from, from our perspective, it's also the supporting infrastructure. What happens with these trucks when they're waiting in line to reach the, the docking then are they, they need more infrastructure and are they putting charging infrastructure on the street which is now a whole nother issue let's say so you, you know that as jeff said it's it's just the whole uh what, what are the ramifications what are the the unintended consequences of some of these that um you know we, we, we great benefits on the pollution side yeah. but what are the other uh issues down the line yeah, just to finalize too, I mean, um, not directly related, related to, to street design, but I think it's something to always be thinking about with the electrification conversation is, is, is yeah, I mean, the fact that we're still mining lithium and other, you know, cobalt and other things to, to get these electric batteries. Um, so that, that, ha that still has global implications, uh, you know, both politically and economically. Um, and then, uh, and, and these, these, these cars are still going to be powered by fossil fuels for the moment, right? So, um, so I think in, in thinking about, still the long-term other impacts of electrification um yeah they, I think this is something to still be thinking about um but also uh just want to add in that drayage i think dray local drayage trucks provide provides a lot of opportunity for for rapid electrification and that's actually where where street design might come into play 
um, because you know, these are the trucks that only stay in the Chicago area or in a particular metro area on a daily basis because they're traveling from warehouse to intermodal rail yard to port, um, and they're traveling. They're you know they're taking the the containers from from place to place. So, um, so I think you know that's the low hanging fruit because they never they're not long haul transport, so they never leave an area. Um, but also, I'm thinking about how we adapt our roads to meet the needs of drage trucks. I think is going to be really important. Great. Thanks, everyone. Well, we're just past one o'clock, um, so I think we'll wrap up here. I just I want to thank all the panelists for their time and their participation and for um, all of the attendees. Thanks for yeah your attention and your time and your insightful questions. Um, I think this is a really intriguing conversation and may have generated more questions than we answered, but um, it was yeah intriguing nonetheless. And we have one more Transportation Tuesdays webinar uh, next week at the same time, uh, focusing on the capital program. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Take care. Bye-bye.